All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we're going to be going over how to set up pretty much any Docker container on your Synology NAS using Linux Server I/O. Linux Server I/O is a great Docker repository that has just standardized the entire process. All of the containers have a perfect config file that you can easily set them up, and so that means you don't have to go around guessing, trying to figure out what you need to set up this container. Anything that they have in their registry is going to just work out of the box with the simple configuration. They've done an awesome job, and across the internet, they're just really well known for having a great repository, and have just done a really good setup. All right, so first off, what are Docker containers? And I could go into a really lengthy explanation about the security and everything about them, but really what you need to know about Docker containers are, they're little containerized services that you can set up and easily migrate between different operating systems. That means that the same Docker container that runs on a Windows server can also run on a Linux server, can also run on a macOS server for the most part. There's an asterisk there, especially when you start including different types of ARM architectures. It can get a little bit different, but for the most part, most Docker apps can easily be deployed on almost any operating system really easily while also actually being pretty secure. The way it's set up is they're containerized off. That means that one Docker container cannot take out another Docker container for the most part. And so if one container is acting up, you can just shut it down and restart it, and it's not going to affect any of the other containers. And there's a lot more security stuff on that, but I'm just not gonna go into that for now. But what it means for a Synology user is, these Docker containers make it incredibly easy to deploy different apps on your Synology and host services. Say in the DSM-7 update, one of your packages that you really liked that was third party didn't get updated to the new architecture. That was really common. Well, you can almost certainly bet that there's a Docker container that's going to have that, and that way the person who owns that application doesn't have to deploy one just for Synology. Instead, they just have one image that works with Docker, and then it can be deployed across so many different types of computers, and that's really the advantage of Docker. It's also really designed to be easily set up and run, but the different configs can kind of be confusing. All right, so then where does Linux Servio come in? Linux Servio is what's called a Docker repository. It has a collection of these Docker containers, all with very good config files. They're all completely standardized. That means that I can tell you how to set up one of these config files, and it will be the same for almost any app on there. You can deploy so many different Docker containers, all because they have very consistent config files that go through and get you set up without any custom configuration or anything like that. You basically just map the environmental variables and everything, and they've done a really great job of collecting all these things into a very stable instance. Personally, I found the best look with Linux IO apps. They almost always just run on any architecture I've thrown them at, and it's been a lot more consistent than, honestly, Docker Hub, which is the primary place where most Docker apps are housed. And so we're gonna go through kind of the process of figuring out how to set one of these up. And we're gonna be using Nextcloud for this demonstration. But as I said earlier, this will work with any app that's on Linux server IO. All right, and so say we wanna set up a Nextcloud instance. So the first thing you need to do is go ahead and install Docker from the package center. It's really easy. And then you just go ahead and Google Nextcloud Linux server IO, Docker. And then for almost any app you choose, you'll see right here, boom, doc.linuxserver.io, and just click on it. And so now you can see this is the very consistent architecture here. It says the exact thing you need to pull, and also has right here two different usages. And it tells you how to set everything up and what the different things are. And so these are going to be consistent across every single container in Linux Server IO's Docker containers. And so we can go through and set these up just so easily. All right, and so now let's say we wanna go ahead and deploy this Nextcloud instance. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to go back into our Synology NAS and we're gonna open up Docker. And what we're gonna do is we are going to go into images and we're gonna hit add and add from URL. So we just need to pull the URL. It's weird, it's not actually URL as you would expect. It's actually the container name right here. So Linux server, Nextcloud. So just copy that right here and add from URL and paste that in there. That was the really confusing thing. It's not actually a URL, it's actually a hub page, but it works. And this is actually gonna pull from Nextcloud. And so now we choose a tag. If you are running an ARM architecture, you're gonna to wanna to go through and look up which one of these is proper for you. But if you're running a regular Synology with an x86 CPU, which all the plus and beefier models have for the most part, you should just be able to pull latest and hit select. 
All right, and so now it's just gone through and downloaded it. You can see it's actually downloaded it from Docker Hub and not Linux Server IO because Linux Server IO also hosts them on Docker Hub, which is actually where Synology generally looks for them, so that's great. And so now you just click on it and hit launch. So we're gonna see there's a lot of stuff here. First off, just give it a name. And we really want to go through and hit advanced settings. Advanced settings are pretty much all of these configurations we've got over here are going to be under advanced settings. And so we'll go through them step by step. So we're gonna start over here. And the first thing you almost always wanna do is hit auto restart. Unless you have a good reason not to, it's just nice being able to have these apps always get back up and running without you hitting start. You can also hit create a shortcut on the desktop, but that gets kind of clunky to me. Now volume. Now we're gonna go ahead and set up volumes. So if we go into volumes right here, we'll see that we've got to have two volumes, a config and a data volume. And so you can see right here, the one on the left is where it is actually on your Synology. So it says path to app data. And the one on the right is where the container thinks it's gonna be. It's basically a virtual link. And that's how it's containerized off is the app actually does not have access to your entire operating system. Instead, it just has access to those folders you give it access to. And so we're gonna go ahead and give it that path. And so we need to go in and we're actually going to add a folder and under Docker, that's probably where you wanna do it. Actually, you definitely should do it there unless you're going to give custom permissions because it's just so much easier. And you're just gonna go ahead and hit create folder. And I would just always start with one called Nextcloud or whatever your server is that you're gonna be running. And that way you can have everything organized. So this is gonna be the Nextcloud instance. And we need to create two folders in there, app data or config and data. I would just call them both config and data. So we're gonna create the first one. And it actually does not matter what you name these. Well, other than illegal Linux characters and such. So just create two folders, config and data. Now we're gonna do the first one. So we're gonna select data. And so this is our data one. So we're gonna do slash data. And so this should match basically the path to data, data. And so that's how they match. And now we need to do another one and path to config, config. So we're gonna add another one. And so you should go through and these two should match what you've set up here. And so now we're good there. Now we go over to network and unless you've set up really custom configs or anything like that, just go ahead and select a bridge. It's so much easier. There are some special things you can do, but that's gonna be outside of this video. And so now we go over to port settings. And you can see it's actually already gone through and pulled in two ports here, even though the Linux server IO one only wants one. So 443 is HTTPS, aka encrypted HTTP, and then port 80 is unencrypted, regular HTTP. And so we're gonna go ahead and set these up. Synology already has 443 in use probably, so we're actually just gonna give it custom ports. So we're gonna say Nextcloud's gonna operate at 6,000, and one for HTTPS, and 6,000 for HTTP. You can just choose whatever you'd like for that, but those are two easy ones that probably are not in use. Now, if you wanna get fancy with this, it's awesome. You can actually use your Synology as a reverse proxy, and I'll go ahead and leave a link to that in the description below, and that allows you to really easily set this up so you actually never have to type in custom ports, and everything will just be handled like that, but I'll go ahead and leave a link to that in the description below. And so this will work. So now we can access it, at port 6001 off the IP address of our Synology. Now for links, very rarely you'll ever have anything in here. And now for environment. Environment are all those environment variables. So we've got two right here. So there's PUID and PGID. So those are the group ID and the personal ID, pretty much the user ID associated with whatever this is gonna be running at. So we're just gonna go ahead and copy this in here. So PUID, 1,000, and GUID, also 1,000. Now finally, time zone. So time zone is there so that you always have the correct time zone, even if you're on a VPN or anything like that. So it's really optional. If you wanna figure out what time zone you're in, specifically how to call it, look up time zone database. Wikipedia and spell Wikipedia right. So it's got this right here. And so you can see right here, TZ database name is what you wanna use. So I live in Los Angeles. So I just search for it and copy this in right here. 
So now I need to say TZ equals whatever time zone I'm in. So I'm just gonna hit add TZ and paste in that. And that way Nextcloud knows exactly the time zone to operate in, no matter what's going on. And so now we've gone through everything. And so now we're pretty much done. We can just go ahead and hit apply. And we just go ahead and hit next. If you need to give it limitations, you can do so right here, but it's really up to you. And now just go ahead and hit next. And so now you probably want to go ahead and hit run this container after wizard is finished and hit done. All right. And so now it should be under containers and we can see right here, it is up and running. So now we said that the ports were 6,000 and 6,001. So let's go ahead and open that up. So we're going to go to our IP address, or in this case, I've actually got a DNS address for this. So it's testbed colon 6001. All right, so my apologies, I am back. I did not realize that it's almost impossible to get Chrome to trust the self-signed certificate. So I was going to start doing my videos in Chrome, just to have a different browser for my videos and stuff. So there's no history over there, but yeah, Safari is the only one that I could easily allow a self-signed certificate. So I'm back to Safari. Because you're just setting this up and you're using HTTPS, the Nextcloud instance does not yet have a proper SSL certificate. It's just self-signed. So you need to go through and get one yourself. And that's the issue we ran into there. Since you know you're hosting it and you know this limitation, you know there's not a man in the middle attack going on. So it's not that big of a deal as long as you can go through and trust it. So that's what you need to do. And so we'll go ahead and give a username and password just make something up. It's going to be very weak. So now there's going to say, Hey, performance warning, we're using a SQLite database. A SQLite database is just a flat file, but if you wanted to, you go through and actually set up a actual database server. So you can easily host this on your Synology. You've got a few options. And if you're going to be hosting this for a lot more people, I would recommend doing that. That's going to be another video. There's a ton of stuff on there. It does take some knowledge of SQL, but Synology does make that pretty easy. But for this video, since it's just going to be for me and just the test, I'm going to go ahead and just use the SQL light one. But if you're going to be doing this for more people, you could easily download a Docker container. That's a SQL server and use that here. And that way they communicate with each other. And that's really designed for a lot more people. And now I'm just not going to install the recommended apps for now. And we're going to go ahead and hit finish setup. All right, and so once it directs you to localhost, it does that automatically. Now you know it's set up and running, so actually just go ahead and hit back. That's the easiest thing to do, and that will take you back to the Nextcloud homepage. Or you can always just go to the IP address, your port, just like you access your Synology, and so it's just that easy. Now we've got Nextcloud up and running. And so we just go ahead and click through this, and yada, 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 and so now it's just up and running you can set up Nextcloud just like you would any other way. We can add files in here. It's so easy to set everything up. And the other awesome thing is it now is able to be deleted and restored because it's already in those data folders. So if you need to update to a new instance, the way Docker works is it just blows away the old container and starts up a new one, but the config files are already mapped the same way. So it doesn't matter. And so that's the really cool thing about Docker config files is you can easily just transport those around and use those to upgrade. So now we can go back into the dashboard and check everything out. And so really it's just normal Nextcloud. You can customize it with your own widgets right here and you can set everything up. There is a lot of stuff you can do in Nextcloud and it's a really great program for file sharing and Docker makes it so easy to set up and manage. And so now that's really all there is to it. Say you run into an issue and you need to restart the container. Instead of having to restart your NAS, you can just go into Docker, go into container and stop it. Now you're able to restart everything. You're able to do anything you would need to when it shut down without actually having to take down your server, which is the really nice thing about Docker containers is they're segregated off and they really can't affect each other very easily. And so now, okay, it's back up and running. And so we should have no problem whatsoever just getting back to that page with the new instance. You can also blow configs away and bring stuff around and it's so easy to transport and migrate between different servers. And really that's all there is to setting up Docker. Linux server IO has so many containers in their registry, all with great config files, just like I showed you. And so they make it so easy to set everything up. It is one of the best ways you can use Docker because it just takes all the guessing out of it. 
All right, well, that's gonna be it for this. Go and leave any other Docker containers you really want me to go over in a new video, and have a good one. Bye.